Sunday summer last year, and the car company Rover is staging a very important launch. The Executive 75 will be the first car produced by the new owners, BMW, combining British motoring tradition with modern German technology. But even as the car is launched, a shadow is cast over it by BMW's own lack of public commitment. And less than a year later, the Germans will announce that they are abandoning the troubled Rover brand altogether. At the end of the day, it was our fault. We thought we can heal the wounds by money. And we didn't, or we realized too late, that it wasn't only money. Perhaps it was even worse. With money, you cover the wounds, but you don't heal them. The tragedy is that Rover could not escape from decades of decline in the British car industry, once the home of some of the world's most famous marks. The problem was not designing the cars, but making them. British car makers never learned the art of mass production. And those who know the industry still argue over where the blame lies. Whenever I used to go and meet managers in, in British Railway, the arrogance, the sheer arrogance. But the majority of faults I've got to be live at the management's door because they designed, they trained, they recruited. That, coupled with unions, which would walk out at a moment's notice. They abused the work of power in an attempt, a political attempt, to overthrow the car industry, and it was almost anarchy. <laughs> the combination is disaster. Years ago, the British motor industry led the world, and Rover was one of its most revered companies. Take three whole cowhides of the finest quality, tan them to the softness of a kid glove, and you have the upholstery for one Rover car. These chairs uh, epitomize a motoring era. I mean, I can even feel the, the Connolly Hyde. I can feel the, mm, the sumptuousness of uh, what uh, British motoring was all about all those years ago. These seats were made by middle-aged men, pipe smoking, uh, wearing um, brown, long brown overalls, uh, who took a pride in their work, and probably whose fathers worked at the Rover too. The Rover car company began life a hundred years ago, producing bicycles. It was only four years later that it moved into making cars. And by the 1950s, it had grown into a successful small firm making quality cars for the upper end of the market. The brand was built on a contradiction. Rover vehicles were both conservative and cutting edge. The world's first gas turbine car makes its bow at Silverstone and is promptly christened the Whizzer. Rover's jet engine car was raced around the world. But back home, its saloons were mainly bought by the well-to-do. Once a driver had owned a Rover, it raised his appreciation of what pleasure and satisfaction such a good car could give. The Rover of the 50s was not a car which the man in the street could afford, but it still inspired a patriotic pride. They had a good reputation. Uh, generally, they was known as the doctor's or solicitor's car because there was the sort of car you could leave a bowler hat on, 
and get inside all your uh, trilby hat on, which were in those, in those days for the fashion. Rover had become one of a patchwork of British car companies, producing an immense variety of vehicles for the global market. British car workers were the most productive in Europe, and Britain exported more cars than any other country. British cars meant that they were the best British-made, empire-made, cars made for the Commonwealth. And Rover had an ace to play, the four-wheel drive Land Rover. Hastily designed after the war as a stopgap for farmers, it was to become one of Britain's greatest motoring success stories, with huge export orders. I think the secret of the Land Rover success was one, reliability, and for the countries it went to, such as Africa, it always struck me, it was a, a simple type of a, a car. It had, you remember the leaf springs? Now, if one of those broke and you were somewhere in the African bush, you could get a chunk of wood, lash it up, and you'd get home. Not quickly, but you'd get home. At home, Rover was aiming at a rather different market. 60s Britain was getting hip. Rover management was concerned about the company's stuffy image. It needed a new car for a new age. The P6, or rather the Rover 2000, as it'll be called when the secrecy surrounding its development is over, is a long, low, sleek piece of luxury and precision. It's a zippy light saloon. You know, the go-ahead sort of people for whom this car was tailor-made. Modern-minded people who are used to quality engineering. Discerning people with a bit of dash. Who are really going places. This Rover 2000 was, was just so sleek and, and, and futuristic and, oh, just uh, a real head turn. The 2000 was a huge hit. It won Rover legions of new customers from all social classes. I got a Rover 2000, I ran it for three months, and I sold it at a small profit. And I thought that's an ideal way to motor. I don't think you could do that today. Well, I bought a P6 second hand for 1,200 quid, a J Reg, and it was the best car I ever bought. Superb performance and uh, I'd taken it from about 40,000 mile on the clock up to about 150. I ran it into the ground. By the early 1960s, the car market was changing fast. Designs were becoming more sophisticated and the cost of machinery for the new models was rising. For Rover management, this posed a particular problem. 27 July 61. Even working near full capacity, there would be very little, if any, profit due to a very appreciable increase in overhead costs. Continental manufacturers were beginning to export large numbers of cheap and often more reliable cars. Future profits would lie in economies of scale. Mass production was the only answer. For the Rover 2000, the company built a new automated production line. To run it, they hired hundreds of unskilled workers on low rates of pay. Whether we got a, a, the wrong lot of people in, whether we got people in that didn't get jobs anywhere else because of and we didn't get the right references, I don't know. But trouble started over all sorts of silly little things. Machines were meant to replace men on the new production lines, taking over many skilled jobs. In the brand new paint shop, the whole base unit goes into the paint dip. No spray painting here. The whole unit is submerged. But the workforce argued that the new machines had not removed the need for their skills. I worked on the, what they call the paint rectification area, which is where all these panels arrived at and they were all put together. And we'd be spraying the tops of the wings, tops of the doors. And for doing that sort of work, that was a skilled job, because you're doing outside paint work and spraying. If a man, you know, uh, could do two or three jobs on the track, he thought he was a skilled man. 
you know, didn't realise that a skilled man was probably a man who worked in the tool room or the jig shop or on the maintenance and spent a five to a seven year apprenticeship. What they got was a brand new process with the car coming up the track and the panels following on the overhead conveyor belt, which is alleged was an old uh, washing machine factory conveyor belt, wasn't really designed for the job, with managements that had never been really into mass production, and they got it wrong. The management say, well, you know, monkeys could build these cars, and in the end, the way they were put together in some cases, you thought they had it done like. All over the world, technology was taking over, de-skilling men and replacing them with machines. But British management could not take full advantage. Here, car workers were still paid per task, according to time and effort. So every time a new piece of machinery was introduced to the production line, wages had to be renegotiated. Industrial relations had really, were really bad in those days. There were innumerable strikes. There was almost meetings of groups that just walk out, out of the factory, have a meeting outside, and that would go on day after day after day. It was the um, it was the rule rather than the exception. Rover was not the only company to suffer. The arrival of new technology was causing disputes across the industry. At the much larger firm of Austin Morris, management was also introducing new machinery to boost production. The workers were expected to produce more cars for the same money. If you are introducing improved methods to improve the product, then that should go towards the product himself, because you cannot ultimately you will price yourself out of the market, which is indeed is exactly what's happened in a lot of cases. British car workers had other ideas. Among them was one union official, Derek Robinson. He was to become a legend and to be vilified as Red Robbo by the tabloid press. Robinson was a communist shop steward who was being groomed to take over the trade union leadership in his factory. He had his own views of the rewards technology should bring. I do not think that workers are fodder for productivity. So you got higher wages off the back of higher productivity? Absolutely. Which seems to me to be very appropriate indeed. If people produce more, it depends on their effort. Because if they're producing more for no more effort, there's no real reason to have any more cash. All they need to do is to teach human beings how to eat grass and digest it, and we work for nothing. Now, that may be the ultimate aim of a capitalist system of society, but uh, it's not mine, and I'll be thoroughly opposed to it all down the line. Ford's Hailwood. Strike bound, production barely ticking over, millions of vital pounds being lost in export orders, and seemingly no satisfactory answer to the rift between workers. A culture of confrontation had developed across the industry. At Rover alone, there were a hundred strikes and walkouts in a single year. If you've been working from half past seven, <laughs> and the only thing in the day that happened was a trolley arrived with bacon rolls on at sort of nine o'clock and it didn't arrive till ten to ten and there were none left when you got to the front of the queue and you'd made your tea and you would have your tea. It was things like that that caused the problems in some cases, smaller things. At Rover the technology was just not achieving the expected cost cuts but this wasn't because of the strikes alone. Rover management had underestimated the potential market for its cars. Sales of the 2000 were at record levels, but they could have sold even more if only they'd built more production lines. With Rover 2000, you can wait only up to two, three years. I mean, it's an incredible time to have to wait for a car. The constant demand for new cars put pressure on the management. They didn't seem to me to have any real policy. We'd have speeches, we're going to do this and we're, we're not going to stand that, but they did. In the boardroom, fears grew. Rover's profits were rising, 
but not as fast as the cost of designing and building new cars. 20th October 66. There is a real problem of finding the money for the forward development program. The managing director proposed to reduce costs by drastic means if necessary. Rover concluded that it was simply too small to compete in the new world of mass production. Britain's other small car companies felt the same. The government agreed. It authorised the creation of one big British car company out of the many small manufacturers. There was a series of mergers and takeovers across the industry. Building a powerful British motor industry with sufficient money for investment was a central part of the policy of the government, and I think was right. Everyone hoped that size would keep Britain at the forefront of the global car market. But the problems of underinvestment and industrial unrest were now deep-rooted, and they would prove disastrous. By 1967, Rover had become part of the third largest car company in Europe, British Leyland. Almost all of Britain's small car firms were rolled together in a single business offering a vast range. The grand design of having a global car industry in this country was flawed right from the very beginning. We had many, many small companies who basically remained virtually the same after amalgamation. What one decided to do in the early days is just put it together and hoping that people will work together. Rover began life in the new company with a flying start. Its engineers created a brand new version of their four-wheel drive. The new Range Rover was aimed at the rich set. The tip forward seats have an easily accessible locking handle that gives comfortable back seat access. Your go anywhere car has become a luxury five seater saloon. Range Rover was to be a huge success for the company, but it would still not solve the problem of selling cars to the mass market. It was expensive to make, and largely hand-built by an often troublesome workforce. While I was only the Range Rover, everybody decided that their job was dangerous and they wanted safety boots. You get on to your superiors who say, 
and we're not having any trouble for the sake of a pair of boots. So you supply that chappy with a pair of boots. And then somebody else wants a pair of boots. And somebody else wants a pair of boots. Until eventually, you know, this, this boot business has got ridiculous. And then something struck me that these people that were having these boots were not wearing them. They were not wearing them. And then I heard a very nasty rumour that if you went down to the local pub, you could give the size of boots you wanted. All British manufacturers must look to the future. Foreign car makers are pretty busy blowing their own trumpets. They've been selling more and more cars in Britain. And last summer, one in every seven cars sold here had been made abroad. In the early 70s, car sales rocketed in Britain. But it was foreign companies who were taking advantage of the boom. British Leyland had trouble keeping up. I remember it vividly. It was uh, August the 1st, 1973. We were completely clean out of stock. We didn't have any Hostons, Morrises, Standard and Triumphs or whatever. And our customers were saying, well, if you've got nothing to, to, to sell us, we'll have to look elsewhere. And yes, they started looking at Datsuns and Hondas and Toyotas. Five years after its creation, the huge British Leyland Corporation was still not producing enough cars and was barely breaking even. Strikes were the visible reason for this, but behind the angry pickets lay outdated production lines. The reason the company weren't making big profits or none at all was because of management. Management took the decision what to produce how to produce it, when to produce it, you know, what the investment level should be, what the marketing strategy should be. Workers don't have any say, never have had a say. So don't try and blame us. British Leyland's biggest rival was Ford. Its top selling model was the Cortina, aimed at the company car market. Businesses were buying whole fleets of cars and adding them to the pay packets of middle managers as a tax dodge. Leyland's answer to the Cortina was the Marina. For the next decade, the two cars would battle it out. But it wasn't an equal competition. The British Leyland car just wasn't as well built. We were finding that they were very unreliable. We had things going wrong immediately. Things like gear sticks coming out in your hand. It was a common joke among my colleagues that they were giving away the marina in a box of cornflakes or a plastic toy. If you were unfortunate, you got the marina. British Leyland was now facing a crisis not of its own making. Oil prices shot up. How long have you had to wait in the queue to get this petrol? Two and a quarter hours. Demand for cars slumped, and British Leyland slipped into the red. Small profits became huge losses. The government was faced with a tough decision. Leyland had problems, it had problems of cash flow and problems of money for investment. And it was absolutely clear that the choice you then faced was either to close down a whole industry which uh, employed 185,000 people or to fund it. And it was absolutely right to fund it. And that's what we did. The government bought a majority stake in British Leyland and poured in £1.4 billion pounds of investment. Rover was the first to benefit it immediately sunk 90 million pounds into the new executive SD1. Rover built what was then Europe's most advanced car factory. And we were all told that the most modern car factory in Europe, this is our future. And that's what we believed totally. I'll drive. No, I'll drive. You drove yesterday. Toyota drivers have one thing in common, a lasting enthusiasm for whatever Toyota they own. 
a new competitor loomed. Reliable Japanese cars were proving a hit in the British market. Hello, Jane. Fancy a spin. Hello, Tony. Hello, Harry. Lovely evening. Because, as we say, with a Toyota, everything keeps going right. The Japanese factories were reaching levels of quality and productivity beyond any of their competitors. British Leyland had to move fast. It called in a British engineer who had just built a factory in Japan and gave him a mission. Build one for Britain. I think I was entirely naive to think that uh, the British uh, motor car worker and the British uh, automobile management, as it was then, uh, was capable of uh, comprehending and, and practicing uh, Japanese um, manufacturing technology. The claim that it was under investment that was the problem would now be put to the test. The new factory was meant to turn out 3,000 cars a week, but when the SD1 actually went into production, the workforce only managed to make half that number. They were being lazy and uh, they were just following practices which had been uh, um, inculcated into them over many years. We were told, quite clearly, this new car, and we were timed on these bases, this new car would need no work at all on it. All you have to do is just touch up the little chips on the doors, touch up little bits and pieces, nothing else. But within months, we were actually respraying the cars in the mini paint shop. There was a reason the cars needed so much respraying. The pride of the SD1 factory was the computer-controlled paint shop. This state-of-the-art method of applying paint required careful operation. Much to my horror, I found the booths, which we would paid such a lot of money for, and they were sealed and, uh, and had this, uh, con these wonderful controls. <coughs> the doors were being, had been propped open. There were people sitting in there, not wearing their um, sterile clothing, but woolly jumpers, and one chap was eating his sandwiches in there because he said the atmosphere was a lot better than there. In a Japanese car factory, if a fault in production was discovered, the line was stopped and the problem solved. But in a British factory, where shortages and strikes were already holding up production, managers took a different approach. I remember once uh, one of our, our operatives who come to me and said, Brian, there's a big dent on this rear wing. One of us created a big dent on the wing. And the manager said to me, if it's got four wheels, it goes. One could have paused and stopped the line on occasions, even for half a day, to cure the problem. But it was never done, I'm afraid. One of the most important things about an assembly line, to get good quality and good production, is to have rhythm. I've been in meetings with Dick Perry, and the thing which drove him was numbers off the line. Because if you stop and start, stop and start, everything goes wrong. The SD1 was voted car of the year, but it cost its makers far more than intended. It reached the dealers months behind schedule, and for some, it hardly seemed worth the wait. Oh, gosh. Um, do I have to mention the problems of the Rover SD1 here? this new paint finish uh, that they were using on the Rover SD1. And I, I think it was a, a good paint finish. It was meant to be very hard wearing, but it just somehow wasn't very good at adhering to the, the, the bodywork. So you would have instances when you were working the, the steam cleaner, because in those days all the cars came down from the factory covered in a protective wax. So we'd be there blasting with a sort of high jet of uh, uh, hot steam and, uh, and water, and suddenly you would just be seeing sheets of, of paint just sort of going up skyward. Once again, both sides of the industrial divide had shown that they just couldn't ditch bad habits. But one side got most of the blame. Industrial unrest was sweeping across Britain, and Leyland was at the epicenter of the crisis. You, yeah. never, you never knew was, from one day to the next uh, when you were going, going to work. Was, yeah, the one time I'd be shot into work um, up past the George and my mate to be in, having a drink outside and he'd shout across or whistle across and say, Carl, get out again. 
No use of just turn round. British Leyland was now losing £1 million per day, but Derek Robinson still wanted more money for the workers. And what's going to end this strike now at Longbridge? I think that if we could reach a basis of some guarantees that money is going to be paid to our members, we'd very quickly end this strike. But not everybody agreed with Robinson. In the late 70s, some workers began to oppose his calls for strike action. Everybody here wants to work! In 1977, the Labour government tried a fresh remedy for British Leyland. New chairman Michael Edwards had a reputation for turning round loss-making companies. The industry was in a shocking mess. In 1977, uh, British Leyland alone lost 32 million man-hours of production. The mission that was put to me was to sort it out. Edwards wanted to reduce the company to a size where it would make a profit. No mercy was shown to famous brands like MG. Its loss-making factory was closed. Thousands of jobs went. Even so, the losses continued to mount. In 1979, a new Prime Minister arrived at number 10. Mrs Thatcher was totally opposed to state funding of industry, but Edwards had a very special case. Basically, my argument to the government was the cost of closing this company would be X, and that is more than the cost, the funds I'm looking for to give us a shot, to give us a chance of getting it right. Michael Edwards knew full well that unless we could see that there was going to be a big financial saving in closing the company down, um, then we would not be willing to take the political flack from doing so. We just couldn't afford at that time to let these industries go down. And what is more, Michael Edwards and the management knew it. And they came into government. We made them put up a convincing plan, but they walked away with more money than any of us ever dreamt would be possible. The new chairman pinned the blame for the company's decline on the unions. Edward's approach was uncompromising. He was determined to cut the workforce and drive them harder. He offered a choice, a smaller BL or no BL at all. One had to say to the employees that if we don't sort this out, we're shut. There's no second chance on this. This was the impression that I, I was giving. I think at that time, Michael Edwards was over a barrel, the government was over a barrel, the taxpayer was, and the art of the thing was to get the workforce over the barrel um, as well, in order that we could get some cooperation out of them. Edwards bypassed the unions and put his plan of cutbacks to the workers in a ballot. 
Over 80% voted yes. The shop stewards were dismayed. They argued that his plan for a smaller company with higher productivity would spell disaster. My attitude was to have a wholly owned British motor company capable of competing with the world on world terms. Edwards came along, fundamentally different, I've enough and sell enough that ultimately would lead to where we are now. Some senior industrialists began to believe that darker forces were at work. They thought that the decline of manufacturing was so severe that it could only be explained by subversive activity. The security services had been spying on left-wing politicians and trade union activists for some time. Now their attention focused on British Leyland's communist shop stewards. Michael Edwards was briefed on their suspicions. At Longbridge, there were 40 members of the Communist Party who had been strategically placed in parts of the factory so that it was possible to bring the company to, to a halt. We know that Mr. Robinson was crucial because I was in a position to read minutes of meetings between senior shop stewards and, and the leadership of the Communist Party in, in Britain. They were totally destructive. The whole attitude of these minutes indicated that they wanted to bring down the heights of the economy, as it were. It was an ongoing plot, no question of doubt. These are charges that Derek Robinson has always denied. He says he wanted to build up the motor industry, while Edwards wanted to cut it down. I think I was the scapegoat for the declining manufacturing industry in Britain. BL's management was determined to get rid of its outspoken shop steward. Well, Derek Robinson, when I first arrived, I had to say to Michael Edwards, that you've got to get rid of one of us, because at the moment, he's running this company, not me. So I had to wait until he made a mistake. When the Edwards plan was put forward, Derek Robinson issued a pamphlet rejecting it. We took the decision to produce an alternative to Edwards, but because of delays, it wasn't completed and printed until after the ballot that, that the company had uh, uh, organized. I rang Michael Edwards to say, I believe that uh, we've got him this time. I believe we can dismiss him. I saw they got a copy of our pamphlet, which was heavily underscored. I said, what are your intentions? And he turned the sheet over, and I knew immediately that I'd got the sack. The plant director told him that he was being dismissed. There's your cards. And Derek Robinson then said to the plant director, don't be silly, I shall dismiss you. My intentions are we'll call the joint shop stewards together immediately after lunch with a recommendation to call the factory out on strike. For a moment, it looked as though Edward's plan had backfired. He had sacked the most powerful union official on the British shop floor, and now would surely face the full force of the trade unions. There were strike meetings across BL. But this time, Edwards found himself with an unexpected ally, Robinson's own union. Derek Robinson came over as a very tough sort of man. Um, there were occasions where Derek had tried to, to bully me, I don't bully very easily. And also, I'd, I'd, I'd got the, uh, the, uh, the, the larger position by, uh, by election than he'd got. I was an executive councilman. I was part of the last word in the union. He was a factory convener. In the end, it was union leaders, not managers, who ended the era of strikes at BL. An inquiry into Robinson's sacking found that he had been dismissed unfairly but his union wouldn't call a strike. 
Robinson had to call out the workforce himself to vote on his future. I was being informed, the workers are not going to vote for you and you'll be humiliated. And I said, if we can't face our workers, there's something wrong with us. We shouldn't be in the positions we're in. And if they take the negative decision, they're going to have to take that decision looking me in the eye. But without strong backing from their union, Robinson's comrades refused to support him. Can we ask Derek? The resolution is lost. Thank you very much. Robert is listening. Well, I still personally have to look for another job, and that's obvious. And um, to what extent that's going to be possible, I think it's um, I think it's highly doubtful that I'll be in the happy position of uh, being able to secure employment in the engineering industry again, so I don't know what I'll do. It was a bit like a child's nursery rhyme about the grand old Duke of York. He marched them up to the top of the hill, he marched them down again. <coughs> he marched them up to the top of the hill and they'd melted away. They want to work and they're working. Thank you. Mark, clear the way, please. Clear the way, please. Clear the way. Clear the way. And the funny thing about it is, what Derek was saying really and what got in the sack is in fact what's come to pass. Derek was saying big is beautiful. The way to survive is not to cut lail and not to sack people. Don't close it down and make it small. Let's stay big because otherwise we won't be able to compete. Now at last BL management thought it could turn round the ailing British car industry. It had tamed the once militant workforce and it had a brand new car, the Mini Metro. I can remember when we were losing money because we hadn't launched the Metro. And I said, no overtime, out, no overtime. And I was walking to the factory about quarter to seven one night, and there were superintendents and foremen and uh, ooh, about 150 people working on the finishing lines. So I wasn't too pleased because they were defying what I said. And when I started to lay the law down to them, they said, hey, we've clocked out. It's our car, not yours. So they're working on it. Marvellous people. Marvellous people. Britain had never given up hope that it would once again compete in world markets and win. The Metro was to be the start. A car that goes 12,000 miles between services is bound to see off the competition. The new Austin Metro, a British car that's beating the world. Michael Edwards had made a smaller, leaner BL profitable, but only just. Despite the sacrifices now being made by the workforce, the company didn't have the money to invest in its future. Had we not slimmed down the workforce, closed factories, sold businesses, had we not done all that, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been funded by the government and by definition, once you spend money on that, you've got less for product development. So there was never going to be enough to go round. Edwards decided the only way forward was to join forces with the country we couldn't beat, Japan. A deal was signed with Honda. BL's cars were to get Japanese technology, and in return, Honda was to get our superior styling. We had to have joint ventures with Honda, collaborative deals. We used their engines, we used their gearboxes. I mean, let's face it, uh, our gearboxes were awful. The first Japanese Rover was the 800. It was the company's most successful car since the 1960s. But it didn't solve Rover's fundamental problem. Indeed, it added to it. And a time came where certain managers of Rover thought, why the hell should we have any technology at all? Why shouldn't we take everything from Honda and we just become a transplant? And when that sort of thought process filtered through, 
there was a mass exodus of engineers. And there was even a time when their engineering center at Gaden was being sold for a song. Even I was offered that. For the Japanese, the deal was the starting point for expansion in Britain. They built factories, and Mrs. Thatcher opened them. Here, the productivity of British workers equaled the Japanese. The Prime Minister sent the return of past glories. I was confident that our people here would draw level with the quality standards in Japan. Having been round and spoken to our people here, I have to revise that as I indicated and say, I am confident that they will overtake the quality standards of Nissan Japan. When I went to the Nissan plant in Sunderland in the mid 86, 87, I saw exactly the same conditions as Tokyo. And indeed, a few years later, that was the best quality manufacturing plant in the world for Nissan. So the fault lay not with the British worker. The fault lay fairly and squarely with British management. Now that Britain's state-owned car industry was finally profitable, the government had the opportunity it had been waiting for. At last, they could get it off their hands. Bids were invited for the renamed Austin Rover Group. But talks with the big American car makers came to nothing. As one executive put it, our walking out was no negotiating ploy. This deal is dead. June 5, 25. The talks failed because of the public outcry. The British felt strongly that they should keep their own car industry. Land Rover owners converged on London to protest. Land Rover is loved and respected around the world. It's in use in 140 different countries. And that's why we must not ever let it go out of British ownership. One of four. The government searched for a British buyer. To the relief of Conservative ministers, British Aerospace was prepared to buy Rover for a knockdown price. Who could I sell it to? GEC, hardly likely. British Aerospace was really manna from heaven. They were the only people, and what is more curious, they actually wanted to buy it. Now, what one would have expected British Aerospace to do is to develop a very robust model plan huh, for the next five, ten years, because it takes that much amount of time to develop your infrastructure and the, for, uh, to develop ro robust cars. That wasn't done. The reason it wasn't done was quite simple. They didn't expect it to be there as a part of their portfolio for very long. Du hast einige Leute ziemlich verblüfft in der Firma. Oh ja? Warum? Darum. Wenn ich die Wahl hätte... The advert for the restyled Rover 800 was more prophetic than anyone knew. Britische Architekt. One German manufacturer greatly admired Britain's tradition of car making. BMW was attracted by Rover's single consistent asset, the ever profitable Land Rover. But BMW also wanted to move into the volume car market and thought it could apply its money and methods to transform the whole Rover company. We were looking for a company which, fit, which would fit in and Rover wa was up for sale. But Rover was an ideal fit in our long-term strategy to cover the lower end of the market with another brand than BMW. It was a, a good buy, let me put it that way. BMW believed they had won a bargain when they announced the purchase of Rover in 1994 for 850 million pounds. But it turned out to be a reckless gamble for the Bavarians. What they didn't realize was the huge problem of Longbridge. And they didn't realize the degree of investment that is needed. And when the pound Deutschmark relationship went the way it went, and with such huge losses projected, 
the economic scenario was not in favor. BMW had also overestimated the appeal and quality of the Rover brand, and even the Land Rover range had problems. Within months of the launch of the new Freelander, the Germans were reported to have found more than a hundred initial faults. Once more, the ability of Rover's management was brought into question. The attitude within Rover was to survive. They were not in a race to win, they were in a race to survive. When we realized that some of the new cars were not reaching the quality targets as fast as we expected, we sent uh, task forces to Britain from our quality teams, from our factory teams, to fix it. There were literally dozens, up to hundreds of BMW people traveling day by day to Britain. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to unveil the all-new Rover 75. BMW poured billions into a new range of models for Rover. The first to emerge, the 75, was voted 1999 Car of the Year. But it was sales, not awards, which counted. And months after the launch, acres of new 75s sat waiting for a buyer. For BMW, the harsh logic of the market now dictated the inevitable. At the end of the day, the forecast for Rover was a, a, a losses, an ongoing loss for 500 million pounds per year for the foreseeable future, not only for the next three years, but for the foreseeable future. And this is a forecast we cannot live with. The future is so dangerous that we have to stop now. Goodness me, did we ever give it a chance? The investment had gone in, the new product was around the corner. Who said that this English patient wouldn't have made a, a, a full and very healthy recovery? Rovers, managers, workers and dealers have been devastated by BMW's decision. Their future is more uncertain than ever. All they know is that jobs will be lost and output will be cut. There are now rival bids for what remains of the company. And amidst the wreckage, the feeling is growing that BMW have not done so badly themselves. The whole thing has been utterly despicable. They've managed to, well, I'd put it, go off with the crown jewels. Walking off with uh, the know-how of Land Rover and the new Mini and the new R30, which is being rumored is going to be the new BMW 2 Series, yeah, has been a... Um, yeah, a, a pretty, well, we would probably say in England, not observing Marquess of Queensbury rules. The bitter irony is that Rover, after all its tribulations, has at last come up with a car of undoubted quality. But the only future for the 75 could be as a collector's item. Oh, the new Rover 75, it, it is just, it's just pure magic. I just could not believe the car. I, 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 I'm still sort of pinching myself and, and saying, was that really a diesel uh, engine I drove? Was that really a, a, a quad cam V6 I drove? Uh, even the entry 1.8 model, oh goodness me, they're just such luxury, just such refinement.